Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to have you all with us as we go through the book of James. Very excited about this course. You know, the book of James has got quite a lot of tough topics that are covered, but it's so important that we go through the Word of God verse for verse like this because it forces us to deal with the tough topics, doesn't it? Um, you know, if we just take, sometimes we can so easily just take the verses out of the Word that that touch us or make us feel good or comforted. But as we go through the word line for line, we we learn the things we need to learn. We learn the lessons the Lord wants us to learn. We get the truth that He wants us to have. So James covers some tough scriptures. So put on your seat belt. You might be in for a bumpy ride. Okay, let's have a look at. I'm going to start with James chapter one and verse two. Verse that probably a lot of you know. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let's read that again. Consider it pure joy. You know the Greek word for joy there means calm delight. Are you and I calmly delighting as we go through a trial. I don't think I can always say that that's, that's the case with me. When we go through a trial, it's tough going, but it's saying here, yeah, consider it pure joy. Be calmly, be at rest, be at rest. Delight in the Lord, calm delight. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because your faith, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, the thing is, God has not called us to a life without trials, a life without difficulties. And every difficulty that we go through, every difficulty that He allows, is there to develop you. It's there to develop your character. It's there to develop perseverance. It's there to make you mature. You know, if you think of a child, if you just allow that child to get whatever he wants, whenever he wants it, if you make sure that that child's life is just easy, they never have to struggle, they never have to work for anything, what is that child like? That child is very often a spoiled child. That child is very often a child who has no patience with anyone else, who has no regard for anyone else. But the child who's had to struggle, the child who's had to work hard, who's gone through difficulties, is often a per well, let's go back to talking about us as people, um, we are more patient with us, others. We are, we are more, more aware of our, own, of our own frailty, our own human weakness, and therefore we are more patient with others and, ex you know, and, and don't judge them as harshly because we realize, hold on a second, I, I understand my own flesh, I understand my own weakness. Because when you go through a trial, you come face to face with the weaknesses in yourself, with the, the areas in your character that needs development. You know, when things are easy, you don't, you don't get to see what's, what's actually, um, what, what is actually a need in your character. Your character only becomes clear to you when you face things and you realize, okay, I'm not as patient as I thought. Why? Because when the Lord allows things to test your patience, then you realize, oh, I thought I was a very patient person, but obviously I'm not. So as you go through trials, the Lord reveals where our character's at and we then go through that trial and have our te patience tested, have our, our love walk tested, have our joy tested, and it makes us mature because we've had to face these things, we've had to deal with these things in our character. So count it joy, count it all joy when you go through things because you know the Lord's letting you go through those things because He loves you. He wants to develop you, He wants to make you mature, He wants you to be strong and you will be stronger when you come out of them. Right, let us move on to verse four, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all, without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. 
because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. I don't think you and I want to be seen as double-minded and unstable, do we? You know, the Lord says, you need wisdom and you must believe that I'm going to give it to you. God requires that we come to Him in faith. God always desires for us to pray in faith. And you know, the Word of God says in, in Hebrews eleven six, it says, whoever comes that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For whoever comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. Come to God in faith. And ask for wisdom. And he gives generously, it says. He gives generously to all without finding fault. He doesn't say, you know, first fix that, first fix that, first fix that. He says, come to me. Ask me wisdom. Ask me for wisdom and I will give it to you. And you know, the amazing thing about this verse is it comes directly after the trials and temptations verse. Why? Because when you're going through a trial, when you're going through a temptation, when you're going through a struggle, you need wisdom. Because it's times like those when you can often be confused, you can often be just not know what's going on, why these things are happening. And it is a good time to seek the Lord for wisdom and to depend on Him. Don't depend on your own wisdom. Don't rush off and do all kinds of things without consulting with the Lord. You can make, in a time of stress, in a time of trial, you can make decisions that very badly damage your future if you don't seek the Lord, if you don't go to Him for wisdom. Say, Lord God, I'm facing this thing. Give me more wisdom to treat this. How do I treat this particular person? How do I react towards Him? You know, if you're going through a trial and you don't seek the Lord for wisdom, you are going to handle people in a way that is just going to destroy relationships because you're not at a good place. You're being tested. You're being pushed. You know, if you, if, you know, the guys probably who wait to train, you know, can relate to this. But if you're training weights, if you're pushing your body, if you're straining your body, um, you're at a place where you are having to use every single emotional resource to, to, to push through that, that, that exercise regime. It's like when you're hiking up the mountain, when you're climbing the mountain, I always say, it is your head that gets you to the top of the mountain more than your body if your head's in the right place but it is a constant it's like don't interrupt me because it's taking everything within me to climb this mountain it's taking everything within my resolve to get to the top of the mountain and so when you in that place you can react badly to people when all your energy is being put into just getting through this trial and, and, and getting to the end of it, you can make, make very rushed decisions. You can react to people in ways that are not pleasing to the Lord. So seek Him. But when you seek Him, believe. When you seek Him, have faith. You don't want to be double-minded. I don't want to be called double-minded. Amen. Okay, let's move on. There's so many amazing verses in this chapter. Verse 9 of chapter 1, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. This is a theme that actually goes through James quite a lot. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. You know, the thing about the kingdom of God is that the principles of the kingdom of God are very different to the principles of the kingdom of this, of, of this world. You know, we, we make a big thing of those who have wealth. We make a big thing of those who have position and who seem to have it all. But God doesn't. God doesn't. He, he says believers in humble circumstances. You know, the Lord values the things that man doesn't value. You are valued by God not based on what you have, not based on the hugeness of your house and the fanciness of your house and your car. You are valued by God because of, 
of the internal wealth. I always talk about internal wealth. It's not so much the external wealth. What's on the inside of you? What's happening in your spirit? What's happening in your heart? That's of value. The character that's in you, that's been developed by the trials that they spoke about earlier. Verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Again, we come back to trials, a big theme of James. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I think that speaks for itself. Let's move on to verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. You know, the interesting thing here is that it's the evil desire that causes us to sin. You know, if you entertain the wrong thoughts long enough, if you entertain the thoughts of anger and, and, and hatred towards someone long enough, or if you entertain the thought of, of let's say, for example, I'm, I'm trying to resist eating too much, and this is a simple example, but let's say I'm trying to resist eating chocolate cake, okay? And I think on it long enough, I'm going to act on it. And after I've acted upon it, you know, that that's the thing about thinking on something and then acting on it. Once you've acted on it, it becomes easier the next time. It's that first time that you act upon the thought, the desire, the wrong desire. The first time you act on that wrong desire, whether, whether that wrong desire is, is a thought of anger towards someone, and if you act upon it by speaking the wrong thing to them, speaking hurtful things to them, it becomes easier and easier and easier to just say what you think, even if it's hurtful. So let us be careful to not entertain the wrong desires, because if we entertain them long enough, then we will act upon them. And once you've acted upon them the first time, it's so much easier to form a pattern in your life, and that leads to death. Amen. Verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. That powerful, every good and perfect gift. God only gives good gifts. He only bestows good things upon us. And, and you know, even the tough stuff that we go through, as we saw earlier, is a good gift because it develops in us the character He wants. Only good gifts come down from above. <clears throat> and I love this line, it says, it says, come down from the Father, of the heavenly light, who does not change like shifting shadows. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today and forever, it says in Hebrews. The same yesterday, today and forever. And He gives us good gifts. Amen. We need to not let the enemy lie to us. The Lord gives us good gifts. If He lets you go through something, it's to do something good in your life. Amen. All right, let's go on to verse 19. Oh, this is a verse I've taught on so many times, and a lot of the girls know it. It's so important to you to see it again. Verse 19, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You know, the thing about quick to speak, quick to become angry is one the, once the words are out of your mouth, they're out of your mouth. You can't get them back. The damage has been done. You've, you've damaged the relationship that, that now has to be repaired, that now has to go through a whole process of forgiveness and reconciliation, so that one moment of satisfaction that you get from just speaking your mind, speaking your heart, that damage, it's not worth it. It's not worth the damage that it does. So it says, be quick to listen. Listen. Listen, don't become angry. It says here, it says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. When you're angry, it's not saying you mustn't be angry. It's saying, it says, be slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness God requires. So that's why it's important that you, you wait, you listen. You may feel the emotion of anger, but you need to listen, you need to wait, you need to not act upon that anger because that anger does not bring about the righteous life God requires. He is not pleased with the result of our anger. I'm sure all of us have got many things we can think back on. That, oh, if I 
just didn't say that word. If I just waited a bit until I calmed down. Because when we do things out of anger, we damage. You damage whether you think you are or not. And that desire to have the last word, I think as women, sometimes we want to have that moment where we say our say in anger and walk out the room and leave everyone like, you know, hanging. Not godly, not pleasing to him. Amen. Let's jump to verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. It's not it's useless you reading the word, walking away, forgetting it, and not even applying it to your life. This is not just a bunch of nice words. This is life. This is words that you need to apply to your life and you will see the effect. You will see the fruit of it, but you've got to apply it. It's, it's, it mustn't just stay here. It must be applied in your life. You must act upon it. I'm going to move on a little bit. Verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue. Oh, another big topic in James. He covers it in, the, in chapter 3. We'll have a look how it covers the whole area of the tongue. Rel those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. You know, I think of the verse in Matthew 15 verse 18 where Jesus said, From the heart the mouth overflows. What is in the heart will overflow out of the mouth. Paraphrased. But what's in here will come out. It'll come out. Watch out. Be careful. If you think on something long enough, it's going to come out. If you think angry thoughts towards someone long enough, you're going to tell someone about it. You're going to say things to that person you didn't want to say. You're going to spread stories about this person because you're so angry. This person's made me so angry. I've just got to tell you. And, you know, and, and I'm so frustrated. And, mm, and we go on and on and on. And really, the things we say is a reflection of our hearts. Ouch. The things you and I say are actually a reflection of what's going on in our hearts. So keep a tight rein on your tongue, but we'll go into more depth in chapter 3. Here's a good one. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Religion that God considers pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows what is that? It's a life of compassion. It's a life of putting others before yourself. It's a life of action. It's a life of caring for the people that are pushed aside and rejected by the world. You know, this world's a harsh place. This world is a cutthroat place, a walk over each other place. But God and the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God requires something different from you and I. We need to care for the downtrodden, we need to care for the widows, care for the orphans in their distress, care for people, practically reach out to them, love them, spend your time reaching out to others instead of being so focused on yourself and your own struggles. That is what God considers religion pure and faultless. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You and I have to watch ourselves. You and I have to be careful that the world is not coming into our homes, that the world and its opinions and its standards and its belief systems are not coming into our heart and into our home. Keep yourself from being polluted by the world. How do you keep yourself from being polluted by the world? By staying in the Word, by studying the Word, verse for verse, by letting it work in your heart, work in your life. By watching what you read, watching what you look at, watching what you scroll through, watching what you pick up on social media. We are to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. Let's not be affected by the world's opinions. Let's not be affected. Watch watch the media, you know, watch the news, watch people's opinions, what people around you are saying, quieten those voices that you may become pure, that you will not be polluted by the world. Amen. Hope you've enjoyed chapter one. Looking forward to getting on to chapter two with you. May the Lord bless you 
And may the Lord increase your love for the Word and your knowledge of the Word. Amen. Amen.